everybody, and welcome to the latest version of All In with Bullpin. And today we're going to be talking about cell and gene therapy. So I'm happy that I'm joined today by our subject matter experts, Angela Myers, head of the Gene Editing Novel Modalities Promise Venture, Jerry Keeble, head of cell and gene therapy manufacturing, and Pat Sullivan, head of our Gen M R&D organization. So first question for Angela. According to Ariston, the cell and gene therapy market is expected to reach revenues of more than $6.6 billion by 2024. What is driving this incredible growth? Andrew, in general, we see double digit growth in the cell and gene therapy space, and it's really attributed to a very strong pipeline. We have over a thousand clinical trials in the pipeline today. And then the second piece that I want to mention is that there is a proof of concept that we are seeing of this the success of this therapy type, uh, both in the marketed therapies as well as the ones in the pipeline. They are demonstrating really impressive uh, complete response rates in the sense that there is no evidence of detectable cancer in some of these treatments um, at the end of it. And so we have a handful of uh, therapies today that are showing 50% or above complete response rate, which is very impressive. And finally, we also see a lot of existing marketed therapies today expanding their indications. That's the final uh, factor that I will comment on um, that contribute to the growth of this uh, therapy. Okay, excellent. So question for Pat, perhaps. CRISPR technology has been a hot topic in the gene editing space for a while now. What is CRISPR technology? Well, Andrew, um, really it, the best way to think about it is that CRISPR acts like a word processor where it can find a word, it can then delete that word, add new letters, or really delete entire sentences or add entire sentences. So the CRISPR molecule, like a word processor, will scan the entire genome, find the place where it wants to make the modification. Uh, it actually cuts that genome, and then it can add more DNA, delete DNA, or just change the bases of the DNA, and it can get, let's say, add a therapeutic protein. So one example of that is in sickle cell anemia, where it has the wrong type of, of hemoglobin, and it changes the, the, the uh, shape of the red blood cell, so it can't hold oxygen. So what they found a way around it is that like a word processor, they find sickle cell gene, they knock out that bad uh, hemoglobin, and then a new hemoglobin turns on, and now the red blood cell is functioning. So that's how CRISPR works. Great, thank you for that. Um, so it sounds like it's all healing, all working, all performing. There've got to be some challenges with CRISPR. Yeah, do you want me to take that? Um, Go on. So, so I would say one big challenge is that, you know, we the it's a big genome, right? And you want to be able to cut exactly where uh, you want to make the changes, but on rare occasions, it will cut other places in the genome. And when that happens, that's called an off-target cutting event. And you don't really want that. And most times that, that off-target cutting will not be a deleterious mistake. It'll just be a neutral mistake, but sometimes it could theoretically uh, be something that you don't want. So we have uh, de uh, designed new platforms that really make the CRISPR molecule more accurate, meaning it won't cut other places. And we have like three or four different platforms that allow us to do this. And that would give the therapeutic uh, company a variety of ways to design a highly specific highly effective CRISPR for therapeutic use. Okay, so Pat, thanks for that. And that's the scientific version. Jerry, um, from your perspective, any specific yeah. challenges you see? Yeah, I mean, I think Pat really described well the method of how CRISPR works, but it, we also have to get it into the patient's cells, which is a real challenge across cell and gene therapies in general. Um, you know, today, viruses or deactivated viruses are still kind of the, the best way to introduce these these tools into patient cells. And that's funny how it sounds, that's really like the more traditional way of doing cell and gene therapies today. But there's a lot of work still to be done to get those processes to be robust. Understood, got it. So what are we doing in order to improve the processes to make it more um, amenable to everyone? Yeah, we're working on a couple of things in parallel, Andrew, it's a great question. We're, first of all, we're taking a look at the core technology that's used in manufacturing viruses, 
and trying to figure out places where there are inefficiencies and really driving uh, innovation to address those. So one area that's you know, really critical to have these therapies reach their commercial potential is to make sure that we're producing enough virus to uh, address the larger patient populations that are coming down the road. Um, we've launched a virus express um, producer cell line, which is having, a, which is both easier to use in our customers' hands, but also produces more virus than a number of competing technologies. And so that's really like a core technology thing. Um, we've been actually operating in the space for quite a long time. Um, we have a CDMO that's been operating for 20 plus years um, based in Carlsbad, California, um, serving the viral gene therapy market. Um, and it's a, kind of a really, um, it's a capability that we're really proud of. Today, um, two out of the five recently approved cell and gene therapies are actually being produced in our Carlsbad facility. So we're also bringing it to practice. So um, I heard recently uh, that we're investing 100 million um, euros on a, a Carlsbad expansion. Tell me a little bit about that. What's going to be different there? Yeah, we're really looking to build on our uh, experience and expertise in commercializing viral gene therapies and recognizing that in the future, we're going to be able to do it at a larger and larger scale. So we're building a facility that's going to be able to operate at up to a thousand liter uh, bioreactor scale, um, which is really going to unlock the the potential of, of cell and gene therapies going forward. Great. Okay. So maybe a closing question, and and I'd open it up to each of you in turn. Maybe uh, Pat, if you want to go first. There's been a huge amount of progress in cell and gene therapy space. What can we expect in the future? What's Thanks. next? Yeah, I think one area is we'll we'll really leverage gene editing technology, and and in the space that we're going to leverage it is to attack solid tumors. Right now, most of the therapies are, are against blood cancers, and again, the efficacy, as Andrew said, is very very high. The initial data using the same approach against solid tumors, it doesn't look like it works or is as efficacious. But new data, new clinical trials have shown if you modify the T cells with gene editing and introduce new things into them and knock out certain things, they become much more efficacious and last a lot longer in the body versus the way it's being done right now. So that's what I think will be in the future. We'll be able to really uh, develop therapies to solid tumors. Thank you, Pat. Angela, what are you most excited about for the future in this space? So I see, in addition to the target indications, also uh, general uh, innovation coming from the CAR-T space where the next generation is going to be safer, even more efficacious, and um, targeting a, a broader set of indications, which in general goes back to our earlier discussion around contributing to addressing a larger patient population and, and making, it, um, making an impact, a bigger impact on our patients' lives. Got it. Got it. Jerry, any final thoughts from your side? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've, we've been talking a lot about going up in scale. I also think it's going to be really important for us to be able to go down in scale in, in the future. So a lot of therapies today are allogeneic, which means that that same therapy can be used in many different patients. But in the cell and gene therapy space going forward, it's probably going to be a mix of allogeneic, you know, like things we've been talking about so far, but also autologous, where you might be starting with your own material from the, from the patient. Um, and that requires manufacturing at a smaller scale. And so as we think about technologies that we're developing for the future, I think extreme scalability is going to be really, really important to our manufacturing platforms, going from small scale, patient to, you know, patient as a batch, all the way up to really large scales like we were talking about in the Carlsbad expansion, um, really driving economies of scale for, for these al um, allogeneic therapies. Cool. Okay. Great. Well, guys, thank you for taking the time to share with me your thoughts today. That's it for this edition of All in Bullpen, and we'll catch you next time. Take care thank now. You, everyone.